time to, to come and take your seats. Uh, my name is Errol Yabake. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, I'm also the deputy director of the Project on Prosperity and Development, which is the uh, project that sponsored the report that I hope many, if not all of you, have in your hands. Um, we're excited to be having this conversation today about uh, investment facilitation. This is building on a report that um, Jake and Matt uh, did back in 2013, also with CSIS. It was at the early stages of the project on prosperity and development, and this was one of those things, this investment facilitation idea was one of those things that, that we just felt like needed a little bit more attention and a little bit more of a framework around. So there was sort of a theory put forth in, in 2013 and uh, earlier this year, we were just talking with, with Jake and Matt, and we said, wouldn't it be nice if there was an opportunity to re revisit some of the lessons that, um, that we've learned since 2013? And this is, as a, as a scholar, this is not always something that we have an opportunity to do. Uh, and so we were very grateful for the support of Cross Boundary to be able to do this second uh, revisiting of, of the original theory. And um, you'll hear from the panelists and, and from Jake about what some of the main takeaways from that, uh, from, from this exercise were. So what we're gonna do is, is uh, Jake Cusack uh, is gonna give a, a couple of opening remarks, tell you about the paper itself that you have in your hands, uh, and then we're gonna go into a, a uh, panel that our senior vice president Dan Rendy is is going to moderate. So, uh, without further ado, Jake is uh, Jake Cusack is the co-founder of the Cross Boundary Group. Uh, he served as a Marine Corps officer in in Iraq, and he won the Bronze Star for actions there. And he has also worked in private equity. He has this really interesting uh, mix of of backgrounds that make the idea of um, investment facilitation in fragile states. Uh, he's the right person to be thinking about this, and he and Matt and Dan together, I think, have, have come up with a really interesting um, set of takeaways uh, in, in the report that you have in your hands. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Jake Cusack. Thanks, uh, and thanks very much, everyone. Um, I was going to open with a with a bit of a thank you and and story of Dan's support, but he, I think he's stuck in traffic, and so I'll save it for when he arrives. Um, but I do think it's it's useful to go back to when we were initially thinking about these ideas and what was the philosophy behind them. Um, and some of them I think have become more conventional wisdom now, but at least to us at the time they seemed a bit new. So. You know, when Matt and I had first met in 2009, you know, we were both coming from this experience of having, I had served in the Marines in Iraq, he had worked uh, in the development sector in Afghanistan, and we were very much disillusioned with big interventions. Um, we felt like we had been part of things where uh, a lot of money was spent, a lot of blood was spilled, um, and the results were unclear. And we were also, at the time, we were at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, some of you might know Rory Stewart. We were in a seminar with Rory Stewart. He was writing a book uh, called Will Interventions Work? Um, and so we were very much in this discussion of like, what is the limits of what we can do in fragile states? And our sort of approach was, you know, we don't think top-down, big, cross-cutting approaches work. We think we need to start much smaller, and can you fix one particular thing, can you make one particular investment happen, and from that get the change that you want to see in a particular market, as opposed to going in and trying to fix sort of everything at once and, um, and sort of being overwhelmed by the size of the problem. Um, you know, I spent time as a graduate student traveling around Afghanistan and interviewing entrepreneurs, and I felt like I can't solve you know, big corruption issues, I can't solve huge security issues, I can't solve huge infrastructure issues, but I can help this Saffron company get enough capital to grow its operations, to extend its supply chain, to begin to export. I can help this pharmaceutical company um, be able to distribute, not just in Herat, but in Kabul and Mazar and other places. And so, um, you know, we really wanted to take more of a, a bottom-up approach. And, and this led to the idea of, you know, working from the transaction up, from 
starting in a more transaction-centered way um, as opposed to just identifying all the things that were wrong in that particular economy. Um, and so, as you'll see in the report, we kind of divide the barriers into macro-level constraints, um, lack of capital constraints or lack of capital for a given risk return, and then firm-level constraints, and that's where we focused a lot of our efforts. So, um, on the transaction costs and on the lack of trust between parties that stops these uh, transactions from happening. Um, and on the lack of capital point, I think another sort of philosophical observation that we had is that the problem generally is not a lack of capital. There is a huge amount of funds, most of them sitting idle uh, in this world, you know, earning negative interest rates or relatively low interest rates. And even beyond that, there's a huge amount of funds that sit in private equity funds specifically designated for markets like Africa, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, um, often in the background supported by the development finance institutions. So even in the most you know, uh, difficult environments, Mali, DRC, South Sudan, there is capital already out there sitting in a fund which has that country as part of its mandate. Um, and the barrier often is not just the availability of capital, it's whether that opportunity, whether the pipeline, so to speak, um, of investable opportunities is being prepared, presented, um, and then connected with those investment dollars in an appropriate way. Um, and one of, for example, one of the success, success stories that we mentioned in the paper is we did an investments facilitation project in Mali, um, and there was a Dutch investor, a Dutch impact investor associated uh, with a Catholic charity, uh, which had never been to Mali before, but had a fund and had Mali in its investment mandate. Um, and we were able to bring them into the, into the country um, on a periodic basis, do a lot of the legwork uh, on these transactions when they were gone from the country. They obviously couldn't afford uh, to set up a full-time presence in, in Mali, and so we sort of served that function. And two years later, they made three investments in the country. Um, and they would tell you that it would not have been possible without having um, the facilitation support on the ground. And so I think the second observation was that capital availability um, is often not the problem. It's matching that capital in a really intensive way, more than just an exchange of business cards way uh, with the opportunity. And then I think the third thought was obviously these macro problems still exist. And how do you use these transactions as a lever to push um, for changes in some of the more cross-cutting constraints. I think sometimes, you know, one of the frustrations in uh, some of the more traditional development approaches is you'd go in to a ministry and say, look, like your land law needs to be changed, you need to get, improve on the ease of doing business indicators. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to do to make your economy look more like the U.S. economy, essentially. Um, and when that's sort of hypothetical, uh, it's hard to wrap your head around a little bit. As opposed to coming in and say, this particular city needs energy, or you know, your people need jobs, and this investment is about to happen if you can remove these very specific constraints. Um, and so having that feedback loop between what you're seeing in the weeds of the investment and the regulatory environment um, and some of the political issues we've found has been a more effective way uh, to push for change, and also to push for the sort of correct implementation um, of laws. Sometimes the laws that are on the book are correct, but if you actually try to explore that on the ground, um, the laws are not sort of being followed in the civil service bureaucracy, and so using, again, a particular investment to prove and test and show uh, that the reforms that have just been enacted can actually be done uh, in reality is, is really useful. Um, I think you know, so one of the reasons we wanted to revisit this is now a lot of this stuff, in our view, has become more mainstream. There's a lot of interest in private investment. There's a confluence of two things happening. One, you have the rise of impact investing, so you have a lot more um, family offices, general interest uh, of people who are either um, wealth being passed to the next generation or just a general sense that people want to be more responsible and have a bigger voice in how their capital is deployed and seeing that it has impact. Um, so you have the rise of impact investing on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have sort of official aid realizing that aid is a smaller and smaller proportion of capital flows into these markets. And so if you want to solve these big problems, you have to be partnering with private investment. Um, but there are some dangers in that, and I think, you know, we're a little cautious now that the hype cycle might swing the other way and think that investment is the solution to everything, and all programs have to have 
um, uh, you know, a huge investment component, and it becomes vulnerable to gaming. I think you know, there's there's people uh, in the investment business who might not have you know development impacts at the core uh, of of their mission. Um, it becomes vulnerable to trying to do private investment for things where private investment really doesn't make sense. Um, not every road should be a toll road. Um, you know, unless there's a revenue line on the other side of an investment, uh, then there's no opportunity for return. But some things are public goods. They should not make a return. Some consumers at the base of the pyramid cannot afford these services. And either they can be subsidized in a blended finance way, so hopefully lowering the amount of uh, sort of government support that's needed. But some of them are, remain purely philanthropic or public goods. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to publish this is to, is to temper it because I think now our worry is that a lot of money could flow into you know, supporting investments and if you know, there's a high profile failure, then people could become disillusioned uh, with the support again. Dan, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll tell you, so, so, so Dan, I just want to thank him quickly. So I first met Dan when I was a graduate student wandering around uh, Afghanistan um, with another colleague, Eric Melmstrom. And, uh, and you know, sort of Dan took us under his wing, helped us get some of our ideas uh, in front of, of Congress and our folks, which we really appreciated. And then when we were sort of in the early days of this, so six years ago, there was only five of us we had two offices, one here and one in South Sudan, um, and you still gave us the opportunity to sort of put our ideas forward, so we're very grateful for that. All right. Thanks. Let's, get, let's have a panel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for stepping in, Jake. Panelists, come on down. Sorry, I'm generally not late to my own things, but I apologize. Thanks, Jake, for stepping in. You know, we've got a hell of a problem. We're going to be. Um, uh, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier chair here at CSIS, and um, the, my view of the developing world is as follows. Is I'm a simple guy, and so there's kind of a hundred or so developing countries. About 60 of them are going to make it. They're going to be South Korea. They're going to follow the path of South Korea. They're, they're going to make it. But then there's about 40 countries that are problematic, right? Fragile states, conflict-affected states. There have been other terms used. For, for these states, I don't know what terms you might know, you might think of, but complicated places, tough places. We're gonna be stuck with them for the next 40 or 50 years, whether it's Haiti or you know a whole series of other, and the other thing though is, at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity in these countries too. There's a lot of human capital. There's oftentimes after a conflict, it's really important to get folks um, to do something other than carry guns around. Um, so part of it's, a, it's a, you know, DDR and, and all the different kinds of terms that are used in the business. Uh, there's a whole series of reasons why we need the private sector to do different things. Or we need folks to say, we need an alternative because of youth bul the youth bulge. A lot of these countries have enormous youth bulges. And so if we don't figure out some kind of, young people are gonna use their energy in, in my view three ways. Maybe this is maybe too glib, maybe too flippant, but just bear with me. The, my view is they're either going to migrate, they're either gonna use their energy for something not great, either joining a gang or an armed group or uh, something else, or they're gonna use it for good, just like everybody else, whether it's in the United States, anywhere else, young people have energy. And they're gonna channel that energy in some way. And so I think this conversation is part of that, that we're gonna be, we have challenges in about 40 or so fragile and conflict affected states. We need to bring in the private sector. There's been a lot of smart people thinking about this. We think this report helps contribute to it. I think Jake has been a significant practitioner in this space. There are others as well. There's also, I see a lot of folks in the audience who've been thinking about and working on these issues for a really long time. Uh, we talk about the work that Paul Collier has done and, and um, the folks at the IFC have done. Um, there's just been a lot of work on this in the last 10 or 15 years, and I think we're going we're gonna to have to do more, frankly. So that's the reason why I wanted to do this report. That's the reason why I wanted to have this conversation, and that's why I think that's why all of you are here today, too. So, Jake, thanks for stepping in and, and helping me out um, when I was late. Um, so I'm really, really happy to see um, my friend uh, Lala Fies, who's the Director of Investment at Conservation X Labs. Thanks for being here. What a nice surprise. I'm really grateful that you would come. What a pleasure. Um, we have Alex Bernard, who's a Senior Managing Director and Co-Head of Frontier Markets at Cerberus Capital Management. Alex, thanks a lot for being here. I really appreciate it. 
Um, and uh, Jim Hake, who's the CEO of Spirit of America, an entrepreneur, and also a social entrepreneur as well. And so I think this is a really great group to help us get at some of these issues. Um, you've heard from Jake. I'm going to come back to him at the end. But maybe, Lala, can I just get your take on this? I mean, you heard a little bit about uh, what Jake Cusack was saying. You um, have seen the report. Um, you've been at AID. You've been at the State Department. You've also, you're now at Conservation X Lab. So how do you... How does how do you how does how do you fit into this conversation? So hi everyone, and thank you Dan for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity, and Jake as well. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my work at USAID because I think that's most relevant. Um, so as most of you know, you know USAID just put out a private sector engagement strategy, which encompasses a large variety of work that USAID wants to do uh, with the private sector. An important component of that is, of course, mobilizing private investment. And a subset of mobilizing private investment is around investment facilitation. It's actually a fundamental component of the strategy. Um, in certain contexts, and I stress in certain contexts, as Jake was saying, it can be a really great way to facilitate the scale, sustainability, um, you know, all these buzzwords that we use in the development world, um, the self-reliance of countries. Um, I think it's really positive to see aid moving in this direction. You know, I think uh, you know a lot of the work was tested around investment facilitation five to six years ago, and to see it incorporated as a fundamental component of a, of a policy is an important step um, towards aid doing more of this work and having more of a role in this space. You know, that said, a policy is just the beginning, and I think we have a long way to go to implementation. And so, I'd like to speak a little bit about what we did under a program that I helped develop with my ex-boss, Dave, who's in the audience, called INVEST. Um, the purpose of INVEST was really to help aid do more work to mobilize private capital. Um, what we realized pretty early on as we developed it was that it's not a space that aid has um, a significant amount of experience in relative to other work that it's done for the last many decades. Um, and for it to really work, aid had to have a fundamental understanding of its own operational limitations and what its partners in the investment community were looking for. And so when I speak about limitations, you know, there were three that we really focused on. One was aid is used to working with, um, you know, we refer to them as the Beltway Bandits. They're large firms. However, to do really robust investment facilitation work, it's really necessary to find niche firms with localized um, geographic experience and technical experience, firms that really understand both development and investment. So we had to somehow figure out a way to bring those firms in that oftentimes don't have the capacity to work directly with USAID. Uh, the second was our timelines. Uh, you know, I worked on so many transactions when I was at aid, and so many of them fell apart because it would take us two years, three years to figure out how to structure that transaction. And by that time, we lost our partner. You know, we, a lot of the times our private sector counterparts, especially in the investment space, don't have the luxury of time. And so we have to somehow speed our processes up to accommodate that. And then the third barrier was, you know, internal capacity. And I think aid does not hire uh, for skills. Uh, relative to kind of financial structuring, investment expertise, et cetera. It's starting to do that more now, but it doesn't have a history of doing that. And I think understanding that was really important because we realized that we had to kind of hold the hands of folks, both in Washington and in our missions, if we wanted to do this work and build their capacity, not by training, you know, one-week training sessions, but actually to help them learn by doing the work. And so we set up a team to do that. Um, and so, based on those three lessons, we set Invest up. Investment is essentially a platform with over 180 partners now, I think. Um, these partners have expertise in investment and development. We get money from our missions to do three buckets of work, or we got money, I, I used to be there, I'm not there anymore, uh, to do three buckets of work. One was around feasibility studies and assessments. The second was around uh, structuring of investment funds and platforms. And the third was actually direct support to companies to help them get transaction advisory services that would enable them to grow and scale. Uh, we did this work across various geographies, ranging from Kenya to India to Haiti and Afghanistan. And we have a lot of lessons learned from it. Um, I think I'll, I'll just say one more thing around fragile states, and then I'll stop, because I know that's the focus of this uh, talk. So you know, I was careful in my words when I said, this works some of the time in some contexts. 
Um, I think that it's not a solution for every development challenge. The simplest way to state that is to say, you know, in a case where you need humanitarian assistance, you really shouldn't be looking at investment facilitation as, as an approach to take into consideration. Um, and I, I think the approach, Dan, there was a question that you asked around, you know, how the approach varies from country to country and if it's different in fragile states. I would say absolutely it's different. Um, it's not just different in fragile states, you know, it's different within a particular country. And Colombia, I work there, it's not a fragile state. But if you're investing on the Pacific coast of Colombia, it's so very different from investing in Bogota and Medellin. If you're investing in a certain country in the ag sector, it's very different from investing in the health sector. And so I think there are variations even within certain countries. Um, there are certain trends that we see. Um, you know, we have more ODA and philanthropy as a component of GDP in more fragile states. We have poorer risk return profiles, a lack of intermediation, um, limited talent, less track record of investment, increased volatility, and increased risk and perceived risk in these states. And I think we have to account for all those factors as we develop our, our interventions. Okay, thank you, Lala. That's great. I think just a couple of points. I, I love AID, and I think they're they're moving up. They're going in the right direction. I agree with you, Lala. I'd say that, um, you know, I think we're going to have to see. I'd like to see AID do yet more in this space. Um, and I think that the the punchline of the report is we're going to need uh, we're going to need more and effective uh, investment intermediaries in these tough places and some of that's going to be done by existing organizations I see some in the room um, but I think that when I, I was just doing a word cloud as I was listening to you Lala I'm just going to just going to run through some things TFSBO many of you know what that is right this was a DOD thing maybe some there's some alum I think in here from TFSBO don't ask me exactly what it stands for but it was their business how to gin up business stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was real, it was a lot of money. AID has done a number of things that Lala's talking about. I think state has attempted to do some of this too. I think OPIC has attempted to work around this as well, and I think with the new DFC, they're gonna be asked to do more of this. You're seeing the DFIs being pushed to go to these really tough places. Um, you're seeing it all over the world. It's not just ISC, it's not just OPIC. Any of the alphabet soup of European DFIs are being asked to go to really difficult places. Um, IFC, the way when I was at IFC that they dealt with this was, okay, these are really small deals, it's really hard, this is too hard for our system. We're gonna set up a series of these funds, I forget what they're called, IFC, SME Ventures, I think is what they are. They're basically like, in essence, the way I read it was like, our system can't handle this, so we're just gonna outsource this, and will you guys just send us a postcard you know, once a year and tell us how you did? And so they'd hire groups that are in this room or others that got some, so help me do Nepal, help me do Burkina Faso or something. And so, so I think we're gonna have to explore different things. I think the investment intermediary thing is a part of that. I'm just impact investing, guarantees, TA, enabling environment, diasporas, um, and I just see, and um, the book Warfront to Storefront, who knows, does everyone know that book, Paul, Paul Brinkley's book? Uh, General Kelly, when he was General Kelly at Southcom, handed out that book to his, to his leadership. Now, that's kind of, that's like the DOD world, and that's one of the reasons why I had Jim Hay here, is that I think the aid community and the DFI community aren't talking as much to the, to the, to the warriors as much. And I think one of the things that makes Jake special is, is he was a Marine before he, he got into the development business. He went to, he went to development charm school and then and, and did that. So we need a lot more of this cross fertilization as I'm listening to Lala talk about this. So I really appreciated you being here. Thank you. Okay, Alex, thanks for being here. You've had a really interesting career. You, um, you've chose not to work on investment projects in Canada or, or Luxembourg. You've consistently for at least probably 10 years from working in frontier markets. So you're an, in, you're an, uh, an, an investor in, in, in frontier markets, and I think that overlaps with this conversation. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for being here. Uh, th th thanks a lot, uh, Dan, and, and thanks to you, Jake, as well, for inviting me to participate on this panel. Jake and I have worked together on a number of things in different exotic parts of the world, so it's always a pleasure to, to see you. Uh, just a, a little bit of quick background on Cerberus, because uh, it's, it's a known name in the investment industry, but perhaps not as much uh, here in Washington. Um, we're one of the larger uh, US private equity firms. We manage around about $50 billion uh, in capital. 
Uh, we own a lot of the sort of household name brands uh, uh, in the U.S. and Europe that um, that you know you you know the name of the brand, but you might not know that we actually own it. <laughs> like Safeway Albertsons, uh, we're the largest shareholder of um, uh, Deutsche Bank uh, in Germany right now, and and Commerce Bank as well. Uh, we own the largest uh, hospital chain in the United States. Um, we own some energy companies. We own uh, businesses across a whole variety of sectors. Most of what we do is in the US and Europe um, and in Japan, so the more developed uh, uh, markets. I'm not involved with that. Uh, what I do uh, for Cerberus is I go out uh, to the, the weird parts of the world uh, and try to basically find the, the, the kind of non-contrarian bets, um, pick the markets that are overlooked by other investors, uh, the markets that for whatever reason other investors are shying away from. Um, but if I'm doing my job well, then these are markets um, that have potential and that are on the right trajectory, uh, and then invest in, in those markets. Uh, and we started off fairly small scale. Um, this was a few years ago, kind of you could consider it a pilot strategy. Uh, so we, we looked at a few sort of smaller specific countries and um, made smaller investments to see if, uh, if it actually was viable um, to do you know, these kinds of deals in these parts of the world. Um, so the, the, the first place where we tried this out was Ethiopia. Uh, and I actually spent uh, some time living in Ethiopia getting this, uh, this strategy off the ground. Um, then we made some small investments in Mongolia uh, and then in Georgia. Uh, and now we're, we're basically expanding um, the strategy because it turns out that, that it works. Um, our, our pilot investments have done well, um, and so now we have uh, a, a remit from Cerberus to do more investments in more countries and also larger transactions. So now we're looking at things in uh, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Papua New Guinea. So again, all, all the really kind of fun, uh, exotic parts of the world. Um, a few uh, comments that I'll make that, that I think are, are relevant for the discussion today. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the, the thesis of this paper um, that, uh, uh, that basically there's, there's capital uh, uh, that exists that is interested in opportunities in these parts of the world, and there are opportunities in these markets that need the capital, but the link between those two uh, just doesn't exist. Um, and frankly, there, there uh, in many instances won't be good commercial solutions to create that link, um, especially when the deals are smaller, uh, just because uh, people, if they follow their, their pure commercial interests, uh, they'll focus on things that are easier, transactions that are larger. Um, there's no reason for Goldman Sachs to open an office uh, in Addis Ababa uh, and start shopping potential opportunities and packaging potential deals. Uh, we, we realize that, and, and that's exactly why we're doing what we're doing in the markets uh, uh, that we're focused on, because what we, what we saw was that there were a lot of uh, private equity firms that would have, for example, a, an Africa fund, um, and in theory, uh, they had the ability to do transactions all across Africa, even in the, the off-the-radar uh, markets. But in reality, when you looked at where they were deploying their capital, uh, around 90% of it was into the, the big markets, um, the ones that were more advanced, more mature. So South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, all the money was going there. Uh, very little of the money was going to places like Ethiopia um, or places like uh, Uganda or any number of countries that are interesting from a macro standpoint, um, have in some cases very large populations. Ethiopia has a population of over 100 million. Um, so large populations, good growth. Uh, again, Ethiopia, almost 10% per year GDP growth consistently for years and years and years now, and yet very few transactions were being done. The question is why? Uh, and uh, the answer, it turns out, is actually fairly simple, and it's that you can't do deals in these very nascent markets unless you actually invest the time to go and, and have boots on the ground um, and, and learn the economy, uh, build the relationships, and find the deals. Nobody's packaging the deals for you. There's nobody who's going to come and you know, say to you, hey, look, here's this great healthcare company. It's in Ethiopia. Here are the financials. Um, you know, here are the shareholders. Uh, here are the background checks that we've done. This is why you know, the, the compliance is fine here. No one is doing this for you. Um, so you have to roll up your sleeves and you have to do it yourself, which uh, is, is not what 
investment firms are used to doing. Um, they're used to having things packaged for them by investment banks, and then they just look at the information, they look at the financials, they do their due diligence, and, um, and then they transact. But they're not accustomed to having to actually build the deal from scratch. Uh, so this is where uh, uh, the kind of work that Jake's group does is, is frankly, uh, uh, really transformational. Uh, in terms of making it possible to actually invest in, in these sorts of markets, uh, um, have, an, have an intermediary that, that is in fact putting together uh, these sorts of transactions. And then, you know, the other thing that, that his group has done, which is, which is very interesting, is um, there's been a few cases where uh, we did invest, um, but then in order to make that investment work, again, you're, you're just dealing with a whole universe of complexities um, in these markets that you don't face um, when you're investing in the US uh, or in Europe. Uh, complexities around distribution, um, around marketing. Uh, there often aren't any kinds of good service providers in the country, so you can't, um, you can't hire a local consulting firm to help you build out uh, a new strategy for how you're gonna, for example, distribute your your, your milk or um, a new marketing strategy for your bottled water company um, that is losing market share and needs to revamp its brand. There, there are not good local consulting firms. Um, so both in terms of deal facilitation and then providing ongoing advisory services, uh, there's just a lot, um, a lot that's needed in these kinds of markets to actually make deals possible. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think the the thesis here is is incredibly sound, and and it tracks it frankly just tracks one for one our investment thesis. Good. Okay. So Jim, thanks for being here. You you had a you had a career in technology before 9/11, and you've written a couple books. Uh, you have great ties to the to the U.S. military, and the way I understand Spirit of America is you have tried to bring, to help, especially America's special forces in particular in some very complicated places. How can the U.S. private sector be helpful among other, in, in bringing sort of other parts of the United States, the totality of the United States, to help our armed forces in some really complicated places? It's more than that, but that's, that's one way to think, to think about it. And you've also, um, but I know that a lot of it has bumped up against how can you get private enterprise going in some complicated places. You actually probably know what TFSBO stands for, you know, and, and so I wanted you to be on this panel because I think this is, this is a geostrategic issue, this is a security issue, and a lot of the, and so there's a, you know, there's a series of Venn diagrams bumping up against this issue of investment facilitation. So I really, and given that you had a past life as a, as a, as a successful entrepreneur, I, uh, as well as a social entrepreneur, I wanted you on this. So thanks for being here, Jim. Pleasure, thank you. So I, I do wear a couple of hats in, in uh, making some comments today. Uh, one is as the founder and CEO of Spirit of America, which I'll describe briefly in a moment. The other, and most of my, um, well, my early career was in uh, principally Silicon Valley as a technology and internet entrepreneur. So my uh, DNA, I guess you would say, is really as an entrepreneur. And it's from that perspective, uh, well, both perspectives, but especially that one, that I, totally endorse uh, the ideas in the report. And I want to point out a few things that are um, you know, what we in, in, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs take for granted a little bit in terms of how things work that are groundbreaking ideas, I think, here in, uh, w with respect to how uh, many of our government institutions operate and many folks in government who do not have that private sector and entrepreneurial background, uh, just very different in terms of how people think. So uh, what, what Jake has done and what he's laid out here, uh, and Dan and, and CSIS, is from my perspective I exactly right. Um, the, uh, and Jake made some of these points in his remarks, the idea of getting down on the ground and focus on specific ideas that work at the transaction level is a profound idea. And um, you know, as one who's made some investments uh, with uh, you know, would-be, or made or not made investments with some would-be entrepreneurs over the years, it's kind of surprising, even in, in, uh, you know, on the West Coast where there are uh, a lot of successful entrepreneurs, you know, people have an idea about, well, uh, you know, I'm going to start this marketing services firm that's going to address car dealerships or whatever it is. 
And uh, you'll say, well, that's great. Uh, who are the car dealerships you've talked to? And people get a very uh, frightened look on their face and go, well, uh, none. And so, and so what uh, Jake has done, is starting with the uh, operator experience in the military, is to understand that you, you can't solve the problems at a really a national level. And uh, Lala mentioned that you know, this uh, uh, investment facilitation approach you know, isn't uh, a tool for every problem, um, uh, to which I would say good, because there is no such uh, tool that's you know, good for every, every situation, and, and you know, her comments reflect that awareness. So um, you're using an entrepreneurial approach to, to uh, uh, that, that Jake has done and his team has done, uh, as Alex was saying, is exactly right. And, and we tend to, I think, lose sight of how uh, small, relatively small things, certainly small things from a, a government funding perspective where people are talking about billions and billions of dollars, how relatively small things can have off-scale impacts. We, we, don't, we, we kind of ignore them or one uh, tends to ignore them until they get big. So you know, just one uh, you know, good and lucky for, for the investors at the time uh, example is, you know, back in 1998, Google was started with two engineers and $200,000 checks. It's crazy, but it's actually uh, true. Microsoft at the time had uh, uh, $14 billion in cash and 23,000 employees and was in all the same markets, of course. So the, the catalytic effect of uh, getting the right people focused on specific uh, needs, specific problems, uh, specific transactions, as Jake has done, is, is uh, I think, exactly right. So the, the, one of the questions is, um, well, where does the money com come from to get this off the ground? And I'll say that's another encouraging thing with respect to uh, USAID here. And uh, you know, I think one of the, the uh, points in the report was, well, it's a, a chicken or egg kind of situation. And uh, we all know that the egg came first, uh, but a chicken didn't lay it. So who lays the egg to get this going? And the USAID you know, uh, helped you know, lay the egg is probably not the best way to put it, <laughs> but uh, you know, provided the uh, you know, initial capital to test some of these ideas. And that CSIS had the, 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 the great wherewithal to take an idea that they had uh, taken a look at many years ago and revisited it to see, well, how did this actually work in the real world? is, again, to me, all these are extremely uh, encouraging things. So the, uh, the, the basic um, uh, you know, premises uh, in the report are uh, there's nothing uh, in that and nothing in the work that uh, Jake and his team have done and the, that USAID has supported that I have any uh, issue with. It's more questions about, well, how do you actually operationalize this in the next level? So, I'm, I'm probably more of a question asker here than, than I am a, uh, a solution provider. Um, but it's, it's this kind of innovative approach which is um, so important in what we, we need to do. I mean, you look at the years uh, since 9-11, and, and as Dan mentioned, I started Spirit of America uh, in response to the attacks of 9-11. Of and you look at the last now, you know, uh, over 18 years, and you say, well, <clears throat> We ought to be able to do better than this as a country, and uh, you know, despite the extraordinary efforts of so many people in, in so many uh, fields, military and civilian, and innovation is really hard because innovation doesn't come from the you know, people who are charged with innovation. Usually, it comes from uh, uh, you know, uh, since Jake was a Marine, uh, you know, General Mattis was famous for saying, you know, in his guidance to. Uh, you know, one stars when they, uh, Marine uh, generals, when they got their first star, you know, take care of the unconventional uh, Marines in your command. You know, the uh, guys and gals who have mud on their boots and rumpled uniforms, because they're going to be the ones with the ideas that if you don't listen to them, the enemy is going to bring you those ideas and you're not going to be very happy about it. So um, innovation comes from outside the system. You know, Jake was, you know, he was, had been part of the system, but outside the system. It's not going to come from the conventional uh, sources. And, uh, you know, the last just uh, observation on this, I would say, is that there's a pretty substantial misunderstanding of entrepreneurs in, uh, in here, here in our nation's capital. And there's this kind of uh, impression, I think, that, you know, they're entrepreneurs who are wild-eyed risk takers and, and, and all of that. And uh, I would say, you know, they, they, you know, entrepreneurs tend to see opportunities, again, as Jake has here, where others only see problems. 
Um, but the main thing that entrepreneurs are good at is reducing risk, not taking it. Because once you see what you want to do, your whole focus is how do I reduce to as close to zero the risk of executing on this opportunity? And the flip side of that is, uh, and again, I have to applaud uh, USAID for, for supporting this, is um, um, you know the, the conventional thing is you know, a million, what about this, what about that, and the questions that can never be an you know, fully answered unless you actually do it. And um, by trying to avoid risk, by not taking action, has massively increased risk uh, you know, across uh, U.S. Uh, government military efforts and, you know, I would say, all around the world. So uh, the, the, the uh, question, I think, and it'd be great to, to focus uh, some time on, is the collective ideas of uh, how does this get operationalized at the next level based on what you've learned here? Because what, what you've uh, laid out is uh, entirely on the mark. Let me just, Jim, let me just take advantage of the fact that you have the, 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 the microphone for a minute. So you deal a lot, you dealt a lot in the last 18 years with the U.S. military on um, a number of in a number of challenging contexts. How many of the times when you talked to them did they say something about, we really need, we could really use somebody to help set up a business or help us figure out a way to get, get jobs for, for we, we need to find these folks to do something other than uh, joining a militia or joining a group and how do we get, you know, what, what can we be doing to get these, how do we get this factory stood up or how do we, these sorts of questions? Well, the, the, the questions, I mean, almost always and, uh, uh, you know, just as background, so we're a uh, privately funded nonprofit. We work alongside both uh, U.S. troops and diplomats and, you know, most of the tough parts of the world and provide, uh, we, we fill the gaps between what needs to be done and what government can do. And we do those things uh, in a, we're a 501c3 uh, charity. We do those things where there is no possible business model for us or anyone else to do those things. So um, in uh, Niger, uh, I'll just give this example, then I'll uh, reveal the secret of TFSBO, uh, BSO, sorry. <laughs> It's easier for me to say task force on business stability operations. They needed, is the they needed some marketing help with. <laughs> yeah, you know. uh, I'll say. Um, so in uh, Niger, the, the, uh, this was with uh, both the embassy, but also uh, uh, special operation, U.S. Special Operations Forces there. The main focus was, well, how do we prevent war in Niger? Because you have all these extremist groups coming from Libya and Mali especially, who were trying to destabilize the uh, undergoverned areas, you know, take, uh, take control of territory, and then ultimately lead the country into chaos and war, as happened uh, earlier in Mali. So the, the solution in that particular case, by getting on the ground and listening to the, the tribal leaders that were the main source of stability in these areas, was to put together a, a package of, of assistance that helped with livestock health. Uh, and the most interesting part of that package of assistance was that we funded scholarships for tribal youth to get uh, veterinary education near the capital, then come back to their tribes, make money by meeting the, the uh, needs of the tribes uh, from a livestock health perspective. And so that provided employment, and that was done in such a way that it, it signaled a maybe hope for the future to many other tribal youth. So that was just one example of that uh, kind of on the ground entrepreneurial uh, approach that worked because it wasn't trying to solve employment in Niger. It wasn't even trying to solve all the employment needs of these tribes, of course, but was a very targeted uh, intervention. So uh, the shorter answer, Dan, to your question is that is something that is at the forefront of, of most uh, military and, and you know, civilian personnel, uh, and they're thinking about what would be good to do. It's usually the case that they lack the tools to do it. And so since they lack the tools to do it, which is the main thing is flexibility, they don't really think much more about it than that. It's like, you, you know, you don't think about how nice it would be to walk to the moon because it's impossible to walk to the moon. So you don't think about things that are, are not, uh, uh, not possible for you to do. And, and that's where uh, uh, private uh, uh, efforts like we're talking about here that are, in that case, uh, government, in this case, government funded, um, have, can, can be extremely catalytic. 
I mean, some of the, the sorts of things that need to be done are not market interventions. Some of them are, you know, the, the, some of this is about filling, you know, there's in, there are information asymmetries. Some of this is about technical assistance. Some of this is about scholarships. So it's a combination of bringing, to the extent you can bring for-profit models or, or sustainable business models or, or social enterprises to bear, that's going to be appropriate. In some instances, it's going to be about getting full market return capital involved. Some of it's going to be about using interesting guarantee models. Uh, Romina Bender, is a senior fellow here, is going to be releasing a report on how DFIs can more uh, aggressively and more strategically use guarantee instruments going forward in tough places next month, so watch this space. Um, so I think there, there's just, it, and it's not just an AID or a DFI problem, this is something that bedevils our, our, um, our friends in the, in, in the armed forces as well. And so I think there's a, there's a need, you know, this is, this is not gonna go away. And this isn't just about Afghanistan or Iraq. This is about Haiti, this is about Colombia, this is about Venezuela, this is about the Northern Triangle, this is about any, you know, two dozen countries in Africa, this is about all, you know, we could all, like I said, there's about 40 countries that this is sort of the, the, the issue, that this is a relevant conversation. And there's probably some sub-regions of other countries as well. So um, this is, uh, I think, um, so Jake, so I'd love to get your reaction given that you've had some really uh, smart interventions from your fellow panelists. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, one, just reflecting on, on this private approach and the, and the ground up. So next week is UN week in New York. You know, there'll be a lot of talk about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and billions to trillions. And I feel like for us, you know, it's when people talk about trillions, I'm like, we're on the ground and it's very difficult to find, you know, $10 million investment opportunities that meet sustainable development goals. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect sometimes, I think, between the high-minded rhetoric, which is well-intentioned of we need billions and billions of dollars in, in these markets. And, and I think a lot of people on the ground are saying, really, we need to, you know, focus on what we can do today um, and not get distracted by um, overly sort of uh, ambitious or unrealistic goals. Um, just to some of to Jim's points, you know, and, and what his charity is all about, Spirit of America, you know, I think it's important, you know, the, the American brand around investment, around education, around technology is very, very strong. And that's not always the case around our military brand, our diplomatic brand in some of these countries. And so, you know, I've found going back to some of these regions where I used to be in the military that uh, generals, diplomats, uh, people on the ground there are far more eager to meet than they were when I was there in an official capacity because they really value uh, American business expertise. And this is relevant to the Prosper Africa initiative, yeah. which was yeah. um, announced this past year. Um, and this desire to say, you know, how is American investment catching up essentially with China and other countries which are way ahead of us in Africa? And again, you know, America is the leader in finance, is the leader in capital markets, but there's a disconnect between our leadership in capital markets and the opportunities on the ground and providing that connective tissue in the form of intermediaries and jump starting through donor support, um, that, that connection is, is really useful. Um, and the other you know, point I'll make, which I think has been an interesting revelation as we've been on this journey for the last six years, is there is a tremendous amount of talent um, both in the U.S. and in these countries that is very, very interested to work on these problems and doesn't necessarily realize that they have skills that are directly relevant. Um, I think, you know, we would meet people who had worked in private equity, investment banking, and the top consulting groups, and they didn't feel like they're, they wanted to do something in Afghanistan or Iraq, but they didn't feel like their uh, skills were relevant. And they're actually incredibly relevant. They're the most needed skills in those markets. Um, and, you know, the first person to join me, uh, Matt and I, was this guy, Tom Flahive, who'd been working in New York on Wall Street, Harvard Business School, you know, that whole thing, and elected to move to South Sudan, to Juba in South Sudan, to, to work he, on it. He went there for the food, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's um, lovely there in yeah. April and Juba. There's, there's great views of the Nile. Yeah. Um, so, so and, and now, you know, we have, we have about, you know, 70 of these really mission-driven, uh, people at cross boundary who you know want to use these skills that they've often you know acquired at you know big organizations and um, but they no longer want to you know do a deal in New York where the best thing they can do is shave you know a 
percentage point off the interest rate for a really large corporation. A, a follow-on offering of, of, of shares, right, on, on an, IP, you know, an IPO or an, an M&A deal or something, right, of pharmaceutical companies. I think just, you know, people want to feel like a, there's a tangible connection to having real, real impact. And you forget that, like, finance, you know, now has a bad name, I think, generally, you know, at least in, in, in the middle America. But finance is a tremendous tool for good. And when you're on the ground in these markets, you see how it actually works, like why this is, you know, can be this great way to move, you know, pools of idle capital, which are just sitting, doing nothing to actually um, provide jobs um, and these jobs and businesses that then can pay taxes and then governments that can actually perform the social services uh, that are needed and create this virtuous cycle um, as opposed to the downward spiral that you see in a lot of these weak states. All right. So this, I, I'm buying all of this. <laughs> so here's my, okay, so the, the takeaway from this conference is, we're going to need a lot more of this kind of stuff, investment facilitation, and it's not just going to be sitting at AID. It's, this is going to be something. There's all sorts of pressure on the DFIs. There's all sorts of pressure on our armed forces. This is not an America-only thing. If you're a multi, if you're the IFC and I'm the United States shareholder, I'm banging on the table saying you need to be doing more in tough places. You need to do that right now. You're seeing a lot more pressure. Um, you're seeing this also if you're the Inter-American Development Bank. If you're a European. DFI or you're an aid agency, I think of the 28, I don't know, I think right now there's still 28 members of the European Union. I think 28 of the 28, um, if you ask, you go look at their aid agencies, like what their top three, and we did this about a year ago. We had some, one of my young people go and, and look, uh, look online to, to do this. And uh, every 28 of the 28 had like the, the fragile, fragile states and forced migration was like a number one issue, like a top three issue. So, this ain't just an American thing. This is a, this is a large global issue. So, okay. So given that we're all kind of on the same page and everyone liked this report, I want the homework assignment of the panelists is let's come up with like some actionable thing each. So if the head of the AID was sitting in the front row here, or Lindsey Graham who can stroke a check to do something, let's assume there's like no um, budget constraints. Let's not assume there's any political dysfunction in Washington. Let's not assume there's like any um, magical realism activity on part of the, some folks and you know and I'm not gonna say who but so let's just put that aside okay so let's put all that aside so if you were Lindsey Graham was here Hal Rogers was here uh, the woman from New York Nita Lowy was here right she's the you know, so everyone in the aid world knows who Nita Lowy is she writes she writes the checks right now everyone knows who Lindsey Graham is if you're in the in the biz because he writes the checks right now so if, if administrator Mark Green was here if the Secretary of State was here if the Secretary of Defense was here. So each of you has to come up with one thing. As I was listening to this, I thought, well, is there an Andy for investment facilitation? Everyone know, some of you know what Andy is. Andy is sort of this grouping that Aspen put together. I mean, should, should we be putting together kind of a, an ongoing quarterly thing of investment? So I'm looking at gr groups in the room here that I know kind of do this, that rhyme with this. I see DAI, I see PADF. Um, you know, should we get the military folks in here who get up in the morning and worry about this? Because they're not, they kind of are off to the side. There's the DFIs, there's all this alphabet soup groups, right? So there's people who have a piece of this. Should we be creating some kind of a network? That's one thing. Should we be, you know, we've done, we've kind of spent six years on this, we've learned some stuff. So now that we've learned some stuff, what should we do with it? So let's start with you, Jake, and, and everyone goes down the panel. It has to be specific to what actionable thing could our friends here in Washington do? Well, I think we could pilot, you know, more robust. Not, I think we're past the pilot stage, actually. We could do more robust. No, no more research. I don't, yeah, no no yeah. research doesn't count. Yeah. No, I'm no, available no, no. for that. I'm a think tank, <laughs> right? I got to pay the bill. So if you want to say more research, that's okay, but that doesn't count. Okay. Yeah. No, I think, I think much more uh, robust funding for investment facilitation platforms in areas uh, which matter. What is AID, how, big, how much money is AID spending on investment facilitation? That would be an interesting exercise. How much are all the donors doing on this, right? Not, not just aid, but in general. I mean, AID, AID may be here too, so, okay. Oh, I just thought my big room voice, everyone could hear me out <laughs> in television land, sorry. So, so you don't have to answer that question, but I think that's an interesting question, you know, but Jake, go ahead, sorry. I mean, Lala might be able to answer it, but the answer is it's not a lot. And particularly when you look at, I mean, there's some massive, historically, I mean, it's, it's diminished a little bit, but there's been some massive aid donor programs in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, which, you know, sometimes in, in my view have been counterproductive in the amount of money that it's spent because it creates 
corruption, rent-seeking behaviors, po new power brokers, when you dump you know, more money than the GDP of the country um, into... Yeah, there's, uh, there's a fuel mafia in Afghanistan, for mm -hmm. example, right? And that wasn't AID funded, that was actually DOD. There, there was a bonanza, uh, there was a bonanza of money, both defense and development and state money. Right? right, and that's your point. Yeah, so I think I think it's not a lot of money to do this much more robustly in you know regions like the Sahel, which are fragile and really need uh, much more investment. And in so I think this is ready for significant scale up. Um, and then the other point I would just make is on the capital side is that there's still uh, not that you know there to have more of an impetus for investors to look at these markets. Um, IFC, I think the SME funds have been a pioneer in this area. We did a study on their funds last year, which you can find online. I think they've actually been reasonably successful given the context. And so encouraging OPIC, you know, now the new Development Finance Corporation, to be actively looking at opportunities in fragile states, and then using, um, whether it's aid or another donor, that supportive investment facilitation on the ground to surface and prepare these transactions, some of which will be suitable for DFC, some of which might be suitable for IFC, and some of which hopefully are suitable to Cerebrus and purely private investors. Okay, so let me just inter interject because I'm, this is great. So it seems to me we ought to be having Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Mnuchin, the head of AID, the head of OPIC, the head of TDA and the head of Exxon Bank and the Secretary of Defense all at a table and have BlackRock, all these funds with all these names in New York, there's like, we're the, we're the, we're the, we're the superpower. We're the, the United States is the world superpower on institutional investors, institutional investing, private equity, and we should bring all these folks to the table to have a real conversation about what can we be doing more to work, get you guys to, you know, to, how can we make you guys more comfortable to work in these complicated, difficult places? And I know Alex will have a view on that, but that would seem to me that would be something I would do if, it, that could be an actionable thing, right? You, you buy that? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Uh, just to echo Jake's point, I think the percent of AIDS overall budget that's used towards investment facilitation is tiny. Um, I'm not going to throw a number out there because it'll be wrong, but it's tiny. Um, so, you know, I think that what I've seen um, from aid and from other institutions, uh, I'll give some observations and then tell what I think needs to happen in, in a world of like butterflies and fireflies yes, and rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there are, there are operational limitations that every institution has. Aid, most of their budget is bilateral. It's allocated um, to a specific country and it's allocated in specific sectors. Um, it only has one type of, it usually uses only grant capital as guarantee authorities are being moved. And so, you know, that is a limitation in itself. Um, there are other institutions have other limitations. So what I would say is a pool Let's pilot a project where you have a pool of really flexible capital that can be drawn down by multiple agencies. You can structure it in the way that you want. It can take on, you know, 100% of the risk and take zero return or do more than that, depending on the country context and the deals you're trying to transact. And, you know, ensure that institutions go in in partnership and in partnership with the organizations on the ground that can actually use that capital appropriately. Okay. I'm that. That sounds good. I'm, I'm, I'm going with that. Okay. <laughs> Alex? It's good. We're, we're making a lot of decisions here today. That's great. <laughs> I mean, we could uh, Why not, right? You know, I, I love, you know, I do lots of highfalutin think tank stuff, but I just think this is a, seems to me we should take some action. That if, if, if we've proven the model, and I think there's a broad consensus in the development community and the defense community, it seems to me, what do we do with this? Is the is the op I think we can is is the thing I want to get out of this conversation. So yeah, you're, it's true. It's true. It's uh, we're, we're making actions here. So I'm looking forward to your your points, Alex. Go ahead. Yeah. So I um, more recently now uh, I've been looking less at smaller transactions and more at much larger ones. Um, so now we're doing a uh, hundred and something million dollar deal in Mongolia. We're doing something that's probably going to be 300 million in the Philippines. Um, we're, we're, you know, looking at transactions kind of on that scale now. And in that context, um, you know, more and more uh, we're bumping up against the sort of unified effort of, uh, of China uh, going after these, these sorts of strategic transactions. And uh, what you see uh, when you go up against uh, these Chinese groups is that they have all the instruments of the Chinese government fully at their disposal. They have uh, uh, the, the, the debt, debt instruments of their uh, Exim bank. They have uh, the political support uh, of their leadership. They have diplomatic support on the ground. 
They have all these different things, and it's all very closely coordinated. Uh, on the U.S. side, you have two challenges, uh, and, and they kind of interlink. One is that uh, American companies just generally have, frankly, more of a home bias, uh, and so it's difficult to get American companies and American investors interested to go to these parts of the world anyway because there's so many opportunities here at home in the U.S. Our economy is strong, our market is huge, and so most uh, American companies prefer to just stay here. <laughs> there's no reason to go to these random parts of Africa or Asia. Uh, uh, it would be such small upside compared to the huge upside you can, you can get out of just you know, continuing to grow your market share uh, domestically. Uh, this is a conversation that I've had numerous times with big uh, American telecom companies. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't ever see Verizon or AT&T going after uh, licenses in Africa or Asia, but uh, you know, the, the Chinese groups are going after licenses everywhere. Even the European groups are going after licenses everywhere. And the answer that I've gotten from you know, senior leaders at these companies is there's no point. Uh, uh, the American market is so big and frankly so capital intensive. Uh, you, you need to invest so much in the US uh, to stay ahead of your competition, to roll out more 5G, more this, more that, um, that they just have neither the desire um, nor the wherewithal to go to these, these far-flung parts of the world. So you have that mixed with the fact that the, the uh, instruments that exist in the US to promote investment into these places are sort of strewn across the bureaucracy. Um, there isn't a single window that you go to if, if you are an American company and you do want to do a, a project in, let's say, Ethiopia. You'd have to talk independently to OPIC, uh, to Exim, to uh, our diplomatic uh, mission. Now, some of this is going to be fixed uh, in October with the new DFC that's folding a few of these things under one umbrella. But still, even when that happens, uh, there's frankly precious little coordination that occurs between the financial instruments and the diplomatic instruments. And often the two are in conflict with each other. Uh, and I can give you a very specific example again. Um, uh, it, it is no surprise to anybody in this room that uh, our State Department, our Defense Department, uh, have a big, big push going on in telecom right now, and they want to make sure that uh, there aren't more and more markets that, uh, that use Huawei and, and, and fall under the, the kind of Chinese telecom umbrella. Uh, so the, the diplomats and the military are trying to promote more U.S. involvement in the telecom sector in these countries. Meanwhile, I had a meeting at OPIC, and OPIC tells me, oh, actually, we don't really like telecom right now because we've decided that for uh, environmental reasons, uh, uh, you know, cell phone towers are a problem, and, and also from a health and safety standpoint, if you're building cell phone towers uh, uh, in, 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 in you know, remote locations, then the people that are guarding these cell phone towers are at risk, uh, and, and uh, you know, we think it's, it's just too dangerous, and so we're, we're actually in the process of moving uh, uh, telecom from one category to another category where it's it's going to you know be disfavored so, uh, so, so that means if, if everyone wants to just get Huawei, it's okay by them? I mean, it just means that they're not in alignment uh, uh, with, with U.S. foreign policy priorities. So this is all a very long-winded way of saying that, that um, I think that the, the, the number one thing that we could do if we wanted to be more effective um, in, in these areas is move towards a kind of single window, one-stop shop approach where there is a, a kind of commercial diplomacy czar, if you will, um, who actually has the ability to reach across the bureaucracy, who knows what the priority countries are, what the priority sectors are, and can then work with American businesses to actually implement projects and make sure that you're getting the investment facilitation, you're getting uh, the OPIC support, the Exim support, you're getting your, your local embassy on the ground in that country to help provide the diplomatic support, that all of that is being coordinated because you just can't expect uh, American companies that already have a home bias to figure out how to string all these different pieces together. Uh, uh, we, we've been able to do it um, because we have kind of a unique situation of you know, people that actually understand Washington and have, uh, uh, we, we have our own policy interests in seeing certain outcomes. Uh, we're a little bit unusual in that respect, so we kind of slog through it, but most people wouldn't slog through it. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Okay, Jim. So things were going really well, and then Alex just ruined my day with a story about OPIC and the telecom uh, investments. But uh, anyway, uh, so the, the one thing uh, in, in terms of recommendation, I would say, uh, is to decentralize. And I think it uh, you know, gets in with what you were just saying there as well. Um, right now, you go to any country, and uh, Alex was just saying this, 
and you say, well, who on the U.S. side is actually in charge here? And basically what you have is people look around and go, well, you know, you would say with the ambassador, but not really, because no one uh, at, a, at a low enough level to be actionable on the ground has authority, responsibility, and resources to put to work to achieve certain outcomes from the United States uh, perspective. So uh, the, uh, you know, and I would say our institutions and bureaucracies probably don't like the idea of decentralization much, because it is messier, you, you lose some level of control, of course, but uh, to devolve and decentralize uh, resources, authorities, and responsibilities down to the country team level. The ambassador, the DCM, would be the, the uh, natural person to be the CEO of that country, which would hold some promise to have somebody, you know, a, a, a firm like uh, yours, Alex, come in and say, well, or uh, an investor, well, who do we talk to about trying to get this done? And at least it would be at the country level. That would be a, a, a big improvement. Uh, uh, Dan, I think for CSIS, convening is a great idea. I would uh, find people more like uh, Alex, Lala, and Jake, and not the CEOs of all these companies, because that will lead to a kind of you know, Clinton Global Initiative sort of thing where you get all the people to say the right things and it sounds great and nothing happens um, because you don't have the operational people in those companies involved. So start small, maybe a little bit more. Uh, the basic premise is outstanding, which is let's bring together a cross-sector, let you know, CSIS bring together a you know, cross-section of players, military, civilian, private sector, public sector, across the board, to start to talk about how to achieve certain outcomes in certain places. Um, I think the, the big marquee names are not the way to get that rolling. Uh, get them to endorse it when, the, uh, when there's a real action plan uh, and things that can be done uh, specifically. Great, okay, so I think I've got some homework assignments. This is great. So good. Okay. So you all been a super patient audience and I apologize again for having been fashionably late for my own panel. So I'd like to hear from four people. I'd like to get four comments. I've got several people I'd love to call on. If you're not going to see some hands, I'm going to start calling on folks. Okay. My friend over here, my friend James over here, this, this woman here, and this gentleman here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Microphone. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Tom Outlaw, uh, formerly of AID, now of uh, Washington Business Dynamics, the group you probably never heard of, but stay tuned. Um, I, I've been in the Middle East for three years. I always make a pilgrimage to the House of Rundi to uh, retap my uh, IQ uh, quotient and uh, get au courant on uh, what's happening in Washington, and today is no exception, so it's exciting to be back. Um, just to echo what Dan said, this is exactly the kind of conversation that needs to continue to happen. Uh, good on CSIS for, for lighting the fuse. Um, Glad everybody is here today to absorb this, and hopefully it'll be the first but not the last of, of many discussions. Um, I wanted to uh, first comment on the idea of the coordination. What, what are the barriers to this? Um, the, the key word is operationalizing, and that is the, the, the flavor of the month, the word of the day at USAID. Um, it is absolutely correct that everybody in the sort of CGI, CEO, Davos mode, saying the right things and talk talk is great. Um, but operationalizing it at the, at the bureaucrat, at the GS, you know, 13, 14 level is what is essential to move this forward. Um, one thing I've certainly noticed from experience uh, is none of that will happen without air cover from the political appointees, money from Congress, and an overall mandate. So that's step one, two, and three that can very easily happen right here in D.C. Um, People talk about coordination as if it is a problem. I see it as an opportunity. I mean, you just listed the agencies that are all gung-ho to do this. That is an embarrassment of riches. So one of the things that AID uh, is doing now is uh, launching its private sector engagement policy. And we actually are the newest kid on the block, the private sector support mechanism that Washington Business Dynamics is going to be leading, um, whose job is essentially to do that. Um, just in terms of a couple of examples of deals, I was just in, uh, in Israel for the last three years. I cannot think of a more difficult uh, operating environment than that. Um, two deals I was aware of that got relatively little attention outside the orbit of, of West Bank Gaza, but I think are very relevant to the discussion. Um, one was done uh, in Gaza itself. It was a deal with the IFC, can the Canadians, unfortunately not us, uh, CETA, uh, MIGA, and, um, and uh, the bank. Um, they were able to issue a guarantee, I think it was roughly $12 million, to cover the installation of about 25 megs of rooftop solar in, uh, in an, an industrial park that AID was very influential in, um, in getting built. 
Now, that is a deal that would never get done. The cost per kilowatt is absolutely insane, uh, but it was done and it was a foot in the door in probably one of the most difficult operating environments in the world. So. Uh, my point is the billions to trillions discussion, it's great. It is very much aspirational. I think the nuts and bolts are with several zeros lopped off of that. And there needs to be a way to credit that uh, towards a development outcome. I think the other issue that will drive folks from de doing deals in America into these much more high risk markets, hopefully, is the push the, 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 the Finks and the Ronald Cohens uh, assigning shareholder value to ESG outcomes and as, as the inv impact investment uh, 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 movement continues to move forward. I'm hoping that we'll, uh, that'll attract more capital to those markets. Anyway, very exciting discussion. Uh, looking forward to continuing it after. This woman here. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Bowerly Dansman. I'm at the Office of Investment Affairs at State. Uh, and so I had a couple of questions. So one of the things that we are really looking at um, as the DFC rolls out, let's see if it actually rolls out in October or if we need to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but um, so, Jake, you mentioned kind of in your um, the in your pie in the sky kind of um, actionable items that the DFC would um, provide more kind of um, support, but that aid would really do a lot of the investment facilitation. So I wanted to get a sense from the panel about whether you think of investment facilitation through the US government being kind of coordinated um, among DFC and aid, or if you think that um, DFC should do more with respect to um, investment facilitation. And then my second question is, um, I was wondering if any of the panelists have thought much about engaging with local government partners such as investment promotion agencies over some of this investment facilitation and if you have experience with that or problematic experience with that, if you could talk a little bit about where local partners fit into this. Thank you. Excellent. Those are great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my friend James over here. Sure. Uh, James from Line, Carnegie and Dom for International Peace, former state. Great to see you guys. Uh, so I I'm going to limit myself here, but uh, just uh, three quick points. One, uh, the background in Afghanistan, which uh, Jake participated in, uh, in part, I, I would just say the uh, short term uh, staffing is a major problem for the US government. Um, as we think about how to structure US in government interventions, particularly in conflict zones, but also in dangerous places where we operate all over the world or places that are high risk for business purposes. Uh, patience is needed, and that's not something that U.S. government agencies, state, USAID, or the military are really structured in those places to allow. Um, I have a good friend who USAID co-financed the startup investment fund in Pakistan. Uh, they've now, on multiple occasions, renegotiated the terms of reference over the first five years of a 10-year investment fund life. So mid-course, you know, course correction, and then mid-course because of rescissions and OMB decisions and things not related to anything. They clawed back money these guys had in pipeline destined for investments. Um, you can't do that if you're going to have a successful private sector operation. Uh, two, um, I think the idea of more uh, operations relevant experts having a, a dialogue on this is a great one. We tried it in Afghanistan in 2010, 2011, 2012 as we were surging troops. Um, the reason it didn't manifest was not because there weren't centers of excellence or agencies engaged or alignment of priorities. It's because there weren't opportunities. The policy environment didn't exist and we required U.S. participation to go forward with our financing. Um, if we're going to do this, we got to think about for those special areas where we, that we think of as contingency zones, diluting our U.S. content requirements. If we're going to have policy objectives, we may have to operate with local partners or other regional countries or uh, other entities just to achieve our policy objectives in those special areas. I, I think the tiering that Jake outlined of you know the conflict zones, the, um, the frontier markets, the emerging markets uh, that I know is uh, existing cross boundaries work is really important. Um, and third, uh, the one of the it's amazing to me that we don't have a conversation about you know we go to war with an authorization of the use of military f uh, force at least theoretically. We don't go to war from an economic and development and you know civilian institution policy framework. We don't talk about market access. We don't talk about immigration and diaspora 
uh, measures or e efforts to involve in the war. I mean, these are things that are vital to our participation. We also don't talk about clearing the roadblocks for our influence over the multilateral institutions. The amendments, the structures that exist that prevent us from supporting or from really using our leverage with these entities to make decisions just leaves the playing field open to others. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Hi. I'm from in background from the Haiti Renewal, Renewal Alliance, and we've been doing the promotion of business development and investment for Haiti for the past 10 years or so. And, they, and I'm happy that, um, um, the, that Daniel, at the beginning, you mentioned the word diaspora, and I'm happy also that just, 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 just to see the gentleman here just m m m mention that word as well. And we've been engaging with the diaspora and also with the government of Haiti and the private sector to facilitate investment in Haiti. And one of the organizations that we work with is the Center for Facilitation of in, in Investment in Haiti. But one of the things that we, that, that we see is to bring in the diaspora in that com com conversation as well, not just a listener, but being at the table, you know, the, to assist the, 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 the funder or the multi lateral institution where they're making investment decision in in this country particularly in in Haiti where that the, there's a lack of capacity to understand those complex inst inst instrument and 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 then and then I hope and I'm bringing it yeah we do have conversation we talk we do talk to USAID the World Bank you name it we've been to, we've been trying to engage them for for them to engage us is always a struggle perhaps that we should have um 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 daniel when you you do we look at the conversation to bring members of the diaspora to talk about their role in their participation in this um conversation as well let me just make one comment about the diaspora. i really appreciate your comment and i really appreciate you being here i'd rather be us than china because of the diasporas in the United States. Language, connectivity, uh, you know, we get, we attract the best and the brightest from all over the world, and many of them have retained ties to their countries, their home, original countries, and they become U.S. citizens and, and make a home here. It's a comparative advantage the United States has. The other thing that we have that China doesn't have yet is we've got all these awesome business schools. So we now have, from different from 30 years ago, this ain't, you know, this isn't 1990 Africa anymore, it's not 1980 anymore, it's not 1990 Central America anymore. You've got now entire cohorts of business leaders all over the world, including in Africa and, and other parts of the world, who have gone to American business schools and have been trained up and are thinking along, I mean, I don't think we could have had this conversation 30 years ago. So I'm really glad you're here because it's a comparative advantage. Like I said, I'd rather be us than them, but I think the China thing is gonna be part of this conversation in a way that hasn't, that's different than 10 years ago, that the next 20 years, in addition, you know, we'd have talked about, 15 years ago, we would have talked about kind of the, you know, uh, terrorism and CVE or whatever you wanna call it. That's certainly part of it, but we're, this, is, this is, so anyway, so thank you. So I'd like, I'd welcome comments from the panelists. I think we can go five minutes over um, if everyone's willing to stay, uh, but I'd like to hear from each of the panelists and kind of react to what's, what's been heard here, and then I promise to end it at 11.05, if you just bear with me. Please, Jake. Great, thanks. Yeah, a lot of comments and questions that I'm very passionate about, and, and also some with reference to the paper. So to the question on the, on the role uh, of the DFC, so we have a, a diagram on page 20 of the paper that talks a little bit about how we see the different government agencies interacting. Um, I mean, uh, certainly uh, some of Alex's concerns are warranted, but generally OPIC has been one of our best foreign policy tools and private investment tools. Telecom uh, deals with standing. <laughs> and, and I think this transition to the DFC is, is fantastic and, and way overdue, essentially, us catching up with a bunch of other company, uh, countries' uh, DFIs. Um, again, the DFC is primarily a, a source uh, of capital. And that capital, I think, should be uh, deployed in sort of a portfolio approach. It should be used for strategic deals, such as the telecoms type deals, 
Most of it should probably go through funds because funds can access a bunch of opportunities on the ground uh, that might be tough to access from DC. And then there should be also a strategy for fragile states and there should be a strategy for how uh, OPIC and the new DFC works with corporates, I think, with corporate venture capital and corporate uh, investments. I think the DFC's technical assistance should be primarily focused around deals where they are highly likely to invest directly. And I think USAID's transaction assistance can cover the wider universe of deals where DFC is just one of the potential investors and there's more likely the investment might come from a private equity fund or a bank or something like that. Yeah, let me just agree with that and just say that I think the kinds of things that we're talking about and the intermediation, a lot of them are like, aren't direct, may not be directly aligned with an investment project per se. And I think most DFIs, and I certainly think the new DFC isn't gonna have the horses or the people to do all this stuff. We're still gonna need standalone entities to do this. It could be PADF, it could be DAI, it could be crossbound, it could be total impact investors, probably other groups in this room. Uh, my friend Tom Outlaw maybe, you know, is part of one now. So there's, a, there's an eco, we're gonna need an ecosystem of groups to do this, that the DFC doesn't have the horses or the capacities to do this because they don't have the reach or they don't have people on the ground that these organizations do. So I'm, I'm buying that, yep. Lala. Uh, okay, <laughs> one more. Okay. I just, because I just want to double down on James's point about short-term thinking. There's another chart, page 23, average deal close time. In fragile states like Mali, it took about three years to close most of the transactions that we're working on. So if the time frame is like, let's do a one-year pilot and see how it goes, oh my gosh. there's no results to talk about. Right, or, or you have one year, big year, the U.S. military have one year to solve the problem, get peace in our time in Afghanistan, and the project takes three, like, that's not, not going to work, right? Yep. And I think, uh, just on the government aid, we've put people inside investment promotion agencies. I think that's a connective tissue feedback loop that we can get a lot better at, is that linkage um, between the private transaction facilitation and the government sector country investment strategy. Um, and we're working with groups like Tony Blair Institute in order to try and kick tighten that up. Just on that, um, I think AID has an appropriate role to play in standing up investment promotion agencies all over the world, and so I think that's a, a function that AID can absolutely play. Lala. Great. Um, who should do investment facilitation? I, th I think aid does have a role to play in investment facilitation. As Jake said, I think it's extremely important to have aid there to help structure these deals and have that high-risk, zero-return capital available to do that. Um, aid also has a presence, you know, in 80 countries or some yeah. some yeah. number of countries, which I think is really relevant. Not just because they have a presence there, but they are linked to networks of providers in those countries, which is really important. Um, I think looking at Invest as an example of how aid can work with small niche actors and really, you know, work with different ones in the DRC versus Tanzania versus Haiti is an important model to look at regarding how aid can really kind of fluidly, in a very fluid way, work with the DFC. Um, in terms of that second point around patience is needed, I, I agree that patience is needed, but we don't live in a world of rainbows and butterflies, and so we're not going to change fundamental timelines of our money. We're not going to have projects that last over five years unless there are fundamental shifts. And so I think taking that into consideration, we did a lot of thinking around how you can operationalize different strategies. And I'll just give one example. You know, we did, a, we did some work with Women's World Banking. And instead of trying to structure a first loss layer in the fund and have the returns go back to Treasury, what we did is we did a deliverable-based contract. This sounds really mundane, but it's really important because that deliverable-based contract enabled us to give them money based on their first close and based on raising the entire fund. It gave them the ability to do that with kind of a promissory note of zero return capital that they can use in any way they want within that fund structure. Um, that's really important, and figuring out those types of mechanisms where we are not a hindrance to the investment partner that we're working with are really important. And so understanding limitations and working within them, I think, is a really important way to move forward. And then just in terms of the diaspora, you know, I couldn't agree more in terms of the importance of the diaspora. Something, It's something that aid is doing more work on. Um, in terms of Haiti in particular, we are launching an investment platform in Haiti. And prior to doing that, we did meet with the Haitian diaspora in Miami, and we also did an analysis of kind of how we could get capital coming in from the diaspora into deals that we found in Haiti. So I think we need to do more of that work. We're at the surface of it, but I think it is extremely important. Okay. Alex? 
Thanks. Um, yeah, just a, a couple of uh, specific reactions to a particular set of comments here. Um, so there was a there was a comment on how the U.S. should try to wield greater influence um, over the multilaterals where it's a shareholder. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I think that there's a lot that is done by these multilaterals that, that uh, goes against, uh, in some cases, U.S. policy, or at the very least is not fully in support or fully in alignment with U.S. policy. And uh, you know that's, that's a little shocking sometimes. Um, the amount of investment that still flows into China, for example, um, you know, through a lot of these multilaterals when that really ought not be a priority anymore. We're seeing some of that changing, which is good. And, and actually, the, um, the US board representatives uh, at the World Bank and at some of the other multilaterals are beginning to take a stronger, uh, a stronger view on that. But more needs to be done. And there should also be much tighter coordination um, with our allies, Europeans and the Japanese. Uh, in many cases, we together with the Japanese and various European stakeholders really do form a substantial block uh, uh, at these multilaterals and, and we, should, we should use that more strategically. We have not done that for years and years now. I think for, for many years we haven't actually thought of these multilaterals as uh, instruments of, of strategy and geopolitics, but they frankly are. And so we should use them that way. We should also coordinate more closely um, among the uh, the country level uh, development finance institutions. So uh, the new DFC um, working together with the, the Japanese uh, development banks, the Australian development banks, and the various European ones. There's there's still a lot of uh, you know different groups out pursuing different priorities um, and not necessarily coordinating very closely with each other. Um, and and that needs to change because there's a huge multiplier effect if we can actually work. Um, you know, together with these other development finance institutions. It's amazing, you know, you, you, you go to um, some of these countries like, you know, Sri Lanka or, or you know, Mongolia or various places where, where I spend time, and people there actually think that the Chinese have a lot more development uh, funding available than the West does, but it's not true. The reality is we have a lot more development funding available, we just don't coordinate on it enough, and so it doesn't, it doesn't seem uh, like a unity of effort, but but if we did coordinate, then you know we would we would drown out, uh, uh, frankly, Chinese development funding in a lot of countries. Um, in terms of local uh, uh, investment facilitation agencies, I, I would say. Um, you know, mixed track record depends a lot on the country. Depends on on the quality of governance in the country. So, if it's uh, if it's a country that has good governance, then um, these facilitation agencies can be helpful. If it's a country that doesn't have good governance, and and frankly, you know, unfortunately, most of the frontier markets almost by definition don't have the best governance, then these local investment promotion agencies can just become vehicles for you know locally connected people to push certain particular transactions. So, I, I I'm always a little bit. Uh, uh, skeptical, and I, I, I engage with those agencies with a high degree of caution. They can be useful um, when you encounter problems, and then and then you you know you can sort of work with them to try to uh, solve those problems. But but as a point of entry um, to actually guide you towards transactions, it, it can be quite risky because of because of how these agencies can be uh, co-opted by local power players. Um, and then on the topic of impact investing, I mean, I'm a big believer in impact investing, um, and and we. We do it um, to a certain extent. I mean, we're, we're not an impact investment platform per se, but um, certainly by virtue of the markets that we're investing in, um, we have a strong focus on uh, achieving some kind of positive outcome other than just financial returns. I think it would be, frankly, irresponsible if we were investing in places like Ethiopia purely with an eye towards making money for ourselves. So. Um, we, we track various metrics, um, uh, whether it's uh, levels of employment at our portfolio companies, average salaries, uh, environmental and health and safety, and you know various things, we track those. So I'm a big believer in that. And there are some groups out there um, that are doing it, and, and we are seeing more of it. But that having been said, I'm not as optimistic just yet about um, the, the impact investment you know, category and, and sort of the broad potential there, because I. I do see generally more talk than action, and I see a lot of 
people going to a lot of conferences um, and a lot of. We're available to run a conference on that, and we've uh, you, lots of you'll, stuff you'll, on you'll, it. You'll, but you'll find many takers. I, I, I agree with you. There's lots. Of, it's, there's a lot more. There's a lot more sizzle than beef on yeah. this still. Yeah. So I'm buying that. Yeah. No. The, I mean, I, I I really feel that way. And and, and there's a and, lot and of. We're available, as I said. If you want us to fund a report, <laughs> we're available. We love impact <laughs> investing. You'll find, you'll find many. You'll find many takers. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's that, that's that's the that's the issue, and um, and also just a lot of uh, frankly what I consider almost bizarre academic debates about what is impact investing. Oh, what you're doing isn't really impact investing. No, you're doing ESG. No, you're doing it's actually socially responsible. It's great. No, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's too painful. I can't, I can't do it. It's too painful. That stuff's too painful. I'm not doing that. Don't come to me with that. Good, good. I'm skipping that. Good. So Alex, I'm buying all this. I'm Okay, so Jim, take, take us home because I think my point is like we have, I think we've solved for this. Like this report basically says we need more of this. So my interest is, is let's, let's do something collectively. Uh, I'm available, let's saddle up, and let's, let's take this that we've learned. We've had 15 years of this stuff. Let's, let's, you know, let's take this to the next level. Let's create an Andy for this investment facilitation stuff in tough places. Let's, let's do some things. So Jim? Well, that is more or less what I was gonna say, Dan. So given your uh, enthusiasm and energy behind convening uh, a good, a collection of folks, an ecosystem of, of players. Uh, I think that's a, a terrific role for you and CSIS and, and deeply, deeply needed. And uh, again, I, there, uh, what I would encourage is involve operators who have experience yeah. doing these things versus the marquee folks. Uh, you know, folks like uh, Alex, Lala, and Jake, for example, who have been doing it and doing the actual work and know what works. And bring together some other folks too from different sectors um, because a big thing that, uh, you know, we are talking about packaging of investment opportunity. Uh, a, a big need for packaging is, well, here's what actually needs to be done at a level that can be taken action on that thing. And, um, you know, it's what we do with Spirit of America, which we work, you know, with troops and diplomats to suss out, well, here in Niger is what needs to be done. And people will take action on those things, but they're not gonna go through all the work to figure out what needs to be done. So uh, a good product of the uh, convening that uh, you're, you're, uh, you've agreed to, Dan, is uh, uh, you know, that focus on what needs to be done at an actionable level with, with folks like you have on the panel here today. Okay, so I've got, I'm taking on some homework. Between now and Christmas, we're gonna do, I don't know if we'll do a public event, but we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna convene, I'm gonna have all you guys, you're all on this panel are gonna get an invite to come back. We gotta think. Of, we gotta go find some money for this. But let's go do something. Let's get real about this because I think this is a big part of the development future. I'm interested in fighting the next war in development, not the last war in development. This is going to be a big part of the future. This is going to hit DFI. It's going to hit impact investors. It's going to hit AID. It's going to hit the defense world. Um, so thanks a lot. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>